Hey everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at how far virtual reality has come since its modern day inception. So what I've got right here is the Oculus Rift development kit. Now this was created back in 2013, this is before we had any sort of modern day consumer VR headsets. This was what paved the way for what we see today. So before Oculus could release the Rift platform and sort of welcome consumers onto this new way of computing, well, they had to make sure that there was some software there. They needed games, they needed experiences that would get people to buy into it. So the way they went about that is by creating a development kit. So basically create the headset or a, an example of what the headset would look like that they could put in the hands of developers, show them how to use it and really demonstrate what this platform is all about. So they created this, what is now known as the DK1, the first development kit from Oculus. Now these sold for about 350 quid and in comparison to today's hardware, they're pretty limited. So I've got my Quest 2 next to me, we're going to be comparing the two. I'm using the Quest 2 as a sort of the example of almost the pinnacle of what modern VR is like. I know there are PC VR headsets that have specs that do beat the Quest at a number of things, but there's a number of things that they don't beat it on. And I think overall it is one of the finest examples of what a modern day VR headset is about. And it's the most recent offering from Oculus. So that's what we're going to be comparing to. So first of all, let's crack this baby open and see what we had back in 2013. I mean, straight off the bat, this hard plastic carry case is awesome. It's small and compact, it's full of stuff. And it, um, yeah, it's really going to look after your gear. It sort of builds a bit of confidence before you've even seen the product. So, you crack it open, and then you greet it with this sort of array of bits and bobs inside. The star of the show, of course, being the headset. Now look at this. Compare that shape to the kind of headsets you see nowadays, and it's, it's miles off. Let's see if we can get that in, in focus there. It really does look like it is just a, a screen taped onto your face, and I suppose in effect, that is what it is, but there's a, a few hidden tricks there. So. This sort of bulky design is what we were given first. It's got a kind of kind of foam pad around the, around the front, similar to what you see on modern day headsets, but nowhere near as hard wearing as you'll be able to see from the kind of kind of form it's in now. Um, so you've got lenses inside. Now these lenses are a big, big step away from what we've seen today, but they're left a bit of room to play with. So um, there's a few tricks up its sleeve which I'm going to talk you through in a minute. But they're not the kind of ringed Fresnel lenses that you see in modern day headsets. So they hadn't really worked out that solution to the distortion that you see on headsets. So um, they've had to combat distortion using software and a number of other things. Now the big shock inside this box is that there's no controllers. So back when the DK1 was released, they didn't really know what VR was going to look like in the future. And they hadn't really thought through every aspect that, like we have nowadays. This unit uses what is called three degrees of freedom. That means that it doesn't track hand movements, doesn't track positional movements within a room. It basically tracks the direction your head is facing and um, yeah, sort of is able to tilt the game around or the experience around. So what you're pointing this at is what you're seeing. If you were to lean into something, that wouldn't be reacted to on this. If you were to try and step over to an object, this headset wouldn't know you've moved over. It basically uses a uh, gyroscope and accelerometer inside and that just helps it position things. You've got no cameras on the outside, no sensors whatsoever. Big difference to the kind of things we see today. Now most modern headsets, the Quest 2 included, come with what we call IPD adjustment. And IPD adjustment is so that you can change the position of the lens to make sure that your eyes are looking at the sweet spot. Now when this was created, they didn't have that. I'm going to show you what that looks like in the Quest now. So this, this is the Quest 2. It's the modern day VR headset that we've come to know and love. We recognise the shape. It looks like a consumer product. It looks like it's made to fit ahead. Now mine has got a couple of changes to it. I've changed the strap on the back. I've also changed the faceplate. But by and large, it's the same product that Oculus are offering. Now Oculus, enabled IPD adjustment with this headset by having lenses that you could click in, into place. So there's three different settings in here and you slide, those, slide the actual lenses along to try and make sure that your eyes are positioned in the right place. Now with the DK1, things are a little bit different. So rather 
the product provided any sort of eye relief through things like that. What they did was they gave you a number of lenses you can swap out. So if I were to twist these lenses inside here, I can actually click them clean off. Then you can see through to the, the screen at the back there. Once you've done that, you've got a range of extra lenses you can put on it. So depending on how your eyesight is, how your head shape is, you'd apply the right lens to make sure that you're seeing the game perfectly. So that's it from the outside in. But how has tech moved on? So what is the difference in specs between these units? It's been seven, nearly eight years since, since the launch of the DK1 and things have moved on pretty fast. So this featured one seven inch screen, so similar to the size of a, you know, a large phone you see nowadays, like a, an iPhone X Max, that kind of thing, a, a, the larger size iPhones, that kind of size screen on your front of your um, headset. Now both lenses are pointed at one screen and it's not even full HD. It's using a resolution of 1280 by 1800 pixels. Now that is shared between, between the two eyes. So that means that you've got a really, really low pixel density there. That means when you're looking at things, they'll, put, they'll appear blurry, you'd get a bit of motion blur, you get some screen door effect. So that's, that's like when it looks like you're looking at things for a sort of grid because your eyes are so close to those pixels that you can see the gap between every pixel. Now if we compare that to the Quest 2 we've got nowadays, you've got almost a 4K picture around here. So we're still using one screen, it's still an LCD screen in the Quest 2, but it's so much higher spec. So that 4K resolution, is an enormous increase in, in pixels between the uh, res resolution you're getting in here. More than five times the amount of pixels. So it's really, really greatly reducing that sort of um, screen door effect. It's really hard to see a pixel on the Quest 2 because they've increased that resolution to such a high number. Now in terms of comfort, it's actually not as bad as it looks. So um, the headset itself is quite light. So there's a lot of tech that isn't in this headset that would be in a modern VR headset. So it means that it's quite light and it fits your face quite well. Now in the book, A Brief History of the Future, they explain how they designed this headset to get the lenses as close to your eyes as they possibly could to get the widest field of view they could when they're playing a game. And what they did was Palmer Lucky actually popped a headset on just like this but with no lenses and they turned a screw in, in place where the lenses would be as far as they possibly could until he felt it touch his eye. It's not something I fancy doing but it worked pretty well because what you, what you end up with is you end up with a headset that is right up next to your eyes so when you put it on you, you really are almost touching those lenses and that gives you the widest field of view you can get so you've got 110 degrees with this now eight years later we're still getting 110 so they kind of nailed that as well as they could back then and we've not seen any real advancement there we've also seen an increase to the refresh rate so the refresh rate is how often this screen is changed every second to make sure that what you're looking at is what you want to be looking at in the game. So if you've tilted your head at all, the screen will have adjusted to point in the right position. If any characters have moved, they'll then be in the correct position. Now, the DK1 refreshed at 60 hertz, so 60, 60 times every second that screen flickers over to a new image. Now, things have moved on quite well since then, so the uh, Quest 2 now runs up to 90 hertz. Now, that doesn't sound like an enormous push, but you really, really feel that extra difference when you play in it. Not every game features 90Hz, there are some that are sadly stuck on the 72, sort of a, a nice little midpoint between the two headsets, but when you can get that 90Hz, you really, really feel the difference. Now it's often said that Moore's Law is kind of dead now in the tech world. If you're not aware of Moore's Law, that's that every year things should either get twice as good or half the size or um, twice as quick, etc., to try and push on to the next generation of products and keep tech evolving. We saw it with mobile phones when they first landed. Every year, the, a new model would come out and it wiped the floor with the old models. Now, that has stopped in many areas of tech, but one area it hasn't is VR headsets. And you can really feel every bit of advancement when you, when you compare these two products. Now, I've had a play with the DK1. Sadly, it's not fully supported anymore because it has been too long and it's officially dropped by Oculus as a platform. But you can source some old drivers if you do a bit of searching on Google. So I've had a play and I've been able to get it up and running. Um, I haven't really been able to experience many games of it, but I've been able to have a quick play and sort of see what it, what it is capable of. And it is a massive, massive drop back from the kind of thing I'm used to. Now the Quest 2 has a number of cameras around, around the headset. So it's got two on top, two on the bottom there, and that's how it can track the controllers. So these are the kind of controllers that we've come to, come to know. Obviously not one with the DK1 at all, so a big, big step up there. So basically, these controllers emit infrared lights, which are picked up by these cameras, and that's tracked by the headset. 
that's an enormous step up because it means that we're able to interact with our environment. We're not there as a sort of passive person as part of this experience. We're actually taking part, getting involved with doing things. That's an enormous, enormous step up. Now that's not where the differences end. So to run DK1, you'd have to connect to a gaming PC. You'd have to connect to a PC that's good enough to run the game you're trying to play at a decent resolution and uh, at a decent refresh rate. Now for the Quest 2, what they've got is in, built into this headset, you've got the XR2 Snapdragon chip, which does graphical processing in the headset. So you could connect it to a PC if you wanted really, really high-end PC VR experiences, but you can also run VR experiences straight through this headset with no PC involved at all, that would wipe the floor with the kind of things that you're getting out of the DK1. That's enormous, and that really pushes the industry on. The things that Oculus have been able to pull off using standalone VR, not connected to a PC, is quite amazing. And I think that is where we're going to continue to see games over the coming years. So there you go, that's a comparison between where we were and where we are now. Should you get the DK1? Well, no. <laughs> it's way too old now, and it's not going to be much use to you. I paid almost nothing for this, but it's good for almost nothing. The Quest 2, on the other hand, is well worth your time and money. So that's a fantastic bit of kit. If you haven't had a chance to try one out yet, you really are missing out and you've got to have a go. Great fun. I really, really recommend it. Anyway, call it there. Do us a favour. If you enjoyed this video, press the like button. If you'd like to see more content like that in the future, press subscribe. And I'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much. Goodbye.